this is Matthew Pose with Pose Acoustics, and on this episode we're going to talk about speaker cables. Actually, we're going to talk about any cables because I have the same opinion about all of it. Um, so I, it comes up a lot. Uh, Gene and I have done a number of videos, Gene more so than I. I mean, he. I got to be honest with you, when he started the channel, I was pretty young, and part of what got me into following his uh, website, really, his, his magazine, was his articles on cables where he was measuring them and showing, because I was just shocked, I guess, be the super, at how little difference there really was in, in those measured performance areas. You know, since I've grown up and, and learned the science a little bit better, I've furthered my feelings that cables don't make a difference. But actually, let's get away from the measurements, and, and I'm just going to relay my personal experience. For a long time, I mean probably 20 years, uh, I've been into DIY since I was a kid. I built my first amplifier when I was 12 years old or so. It was a kit, but it was still, you know, circuit board and, and you had to put the parts on and it was all point to point, or not point to point, it was all uh, through hole wiring, uh, soldering, and so, you know, followed the instructions, built it, hooked it up and, and made it work and have done many since then, including designing some from scratch that were not very good, but it was a fun, fun thing to do. So I've been into DIYing and I decided to look at how other companies were making their cables and copy it. And I went and bought all sorts of fancy copper wire, including the single crystal copper that's very expensive. I also bought silver of many different kinds, including I bought just raw silver wire that was a very high quality and high purity and then hand pushed the wire through foamed Teflon tubing that I purchased and then I took that and I created my own interconnect cables and, in, and my own uh, speaker cables with it by either hand braiding or hand twisting and shielding you know I added cotton rope around the outside of it and then I added a shield to it that was a braided shield that covered the whole thing and then I terminated it with you know all sorts of the most expensive connectors money could buy kind of a thing I tried it all because I thought maybe it makes a difference and I remember at one point I was doing it and I was like, oh, these cables are great. And part of it was, I think, the excitement that I made something and it didn't, you know, blow up. Um, and then I remember when I first got into reviewing, I decided to sit down one day with this new amplifier I had that was, um, just at the time, it would have been the best amplifier I had ever used. I think it was from Krell. And it was a very low noise, low distortion for the time at least, amplifier with more power than anything I had had, and it used balanced connections, and I actually received a balanced preamp and a balanced DAC. And so I decided to make some balanced cables, and I had some really good quality pro audio balanced cables, and I don't remember who made them anymore, but the cable stock itself was Mogami, which is good quality. And the connectors were what are, like some industry standard connector, I forget exactly, but all XLRs and everything. And I went and made my own silver ones where I twisted together, or I may have braided together the, the uh, silver cable for everything. And then I, as I said, I shielded the whole thing and I soldered it all with silver solder and I put high quality, I think they were Cardis XLR connectors um, I also ended up receiving some Cardis balance cables that were pretty expensive. And I plugged in mine, and I thought the system sounds really good. Mind you, there was no comparison yet. I unplugged them and I plugged in the Cardis ones, and I thought this system sounds really good too. Didn't really have any sort of aha, like they don't sound different, just the system still sounds really good. Then I plugged in the Pro ones that had the Mogami stock to it. I thought, still sounds really good. And that was around the moment when I said, you know, it doesn't actually sound any worse. Well, maybe, you know, then I thought, well, maybe even though the other ones are prettier, maybe at the end of the day, the quality of that is the same as these Mogami-based Pro cables. I mean, they're not cheap either. They would have been a lot cheaper than these high-end ones and the DIY one even if it was a retail product, but they were not cheap. So then I went and um, found the cheapest most basic balanced cable I could. And it was from a company, Hosa? I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, H-O-S-A, I think it's Hosa. Um, it's, it's about as cheap as it gets. It was like molded connectors. I have no idea what the cable stock was, but nothing special that I know of. I think they were like six or seven dollars a piece at the time 
for each channel, plug that in still sounded exactly the same. There was no more noise or distortion and the sound quality didn't lessen. So then I thought, well, this is not a great way to compare. What I'll do is I'll place the left and the right speaker next to each other. I'll, um, I'll connect one with the high end cable and one with the low end cable and I'll hook it to my computer through, I had a balanced uh, sound interface, like a pro one, um, which would have been very good quality. And I'll AB back and forth between them um, now I knew which was which, I wasn't blind, but at least it was like a better comparison. So I did that and I just didn't think I could hear a difference. Every time I thought I could hear a difference, I would do things like switch it up or like kind of intentionally. So then anyway, I had a friend come over after doing all that and I said, hey, so I'm, I'm feeling kind of down here. I thought for years that this stuff that I was doing with cables made a difference and I invested in all these DIY cables that I made and I'm sitting here playing with some really good gear and I'm A-being between these super cheap balance cable and an expensive balance cable. And I'm not hearing a difference, but I'm thinking maybe it's just because of what I'm doing. Can you come and A-B for me and don't tell me what you're switching and I'm, and I'm gonna tell you which one I think it is. So he did it and we put a, like a scrim cloth in front of the speaker to turn it into like more of a blind scenario. It wasn't a double blind test, it was I suppose a single blind test, although I'd be shocked if the person switching actually knew which was which. I don't think he was paying that much attention. At the end of the day, the two of us got so mixed up on which was which that we had no idea and we definitely couldn't hear a difference. So I just walked away from it thinking, okay, I think that I've been wrong about this all these years. Then I got into measuring the cables and I had some, well, I had my sound interface and there was a way to measure through that, so I did that and I couldn't measure any meaningful differences. There was, if you get into the way extremes there were, but to be honest with you, the Cardis cable that I had measured the worst of them and the Hosa and the Mogami measured about the same, very, very slight differences. Um, the DIY one I made measured kind of in between the two. So the most expensive one wasn't the best measuring. Well, whether any of that would make a difference in sound, I don't know, because the Cardis one, um, the, the things it was doing was rotating phase at like 80 kilohertz, and the frequency response was rolling off a little bit sooner. We also were talking about like a quarter of a decibel at 80 kilohertz, so what difference that makes, I don't know. Um, over the years, I've gotten better measurement equipment. I've, again, I've measured, I've done all different types of measurements to see, and I couldn't see a difference. But I want to go back to the subjective part. I've listened. It's not like I haven't listened to this stuff and tried. It, the problem was, at the end of the day, when I really sat there and played around with some relatively cheap but halfway decent cables, and, and halfway decent being, again, Hosa, it's, it's not total junk. I mean, the, the cable stock is decent, and they're reliable and really, really expensive audiophile cables, I didn't think I heard a difference. And then I thought, well, maybe Cardis isn't really high-end. Maybe that's the problem. So I tried some other brands. MIT for a while was a big one. I tried those, it didn't hear a difference. Um, I tried, I'm trying to remember the different brands now, DH Labs, Synergistic Research, and I still walked away not thinking I heard a difference. Um, Gene and I have been challenged to do some proper double-blind tests at the facilities where these people make these cables. And I'll be honest, I'm kind of curious to try it, but I would really want it done more independently than having them do it. I would want, if anything, I wouldn't want to do it in their shop. I'd want to be able to set the test up myself so that I know what the conditions are. I'd want to make sure the equipment is actually really good, transparent equipment, not stuff that just seems that way. But I still don't think that I'd walk away hearing a difference. I actually am more curious to try it to kind of prove a point, I think, at this point because I feel fairly confident that I've already proven that point to myself, um, that the cables don't really make a difference. Even if they do make a difference, whatever it is, is so subtle compared to all the other things in the system that that money should be spent elsewhere. So do, you know, how do you pick speaker cable? Let's just start with that one. I think that it should be copper, not copper clad aluminum. If for no other reason, then there isn't that big a difference in price and copper is certainly a little bit better than copper clad aluminum. It should be of sufficient thickness that you're not going to run into high losses. Um, you know, whether this makes an audible difference, I don't know, but when the resistance of the cable is too high, it does kill the uh, damping factor of the amplifier pretty substantially, even though it's a small amount of resistance in the cable. 
So, you know, I generally say go a little thicker than you probably think you need. Um, for short lengths, for a lot of people, 16 gauge is probably adequate. 18 gauge is a little thin, I don't think I'd do that. But I would go 14 gauge, I think that's better. Um, 12 gauge is better yet. 10 gauge gets pretty expensive and I would say I would reserve 10 gauge for like subwoofers or really big high power speakers where the runs are gonna be more than 15 feet, let's say. If your runs are under even probably 20 feet, 16 to 14 gauge is probably fine for almost anything. You're not gonna have major, major issues with that. Um, now, you know, just keep in mind for like all of my in-wall stuff, everything was um, 14.2 or 14.4 and then in the theater, everything was 12 to 12, four, or the overhead stuff was all 14, four. So that's really adequate for even like a home theater. Gene did 10 to, and he used, it's just pretty standard copper wire. There's nothing special about it and it works. So for speakers, that's kind of to me where it's at. And I think in wall cables, cause it's twisted. That is a little bit better than the parallel run stuff. So if like there's gonna be some technical differences that might possibly affect noise, the twisting is gonna reject noise a little bit. But this, the voltage levels are so high in those cables because it's an amplifier um, that it's not a huge problem. So that's that's uh, speaker cable. Signal cables like RCA and XLRs, I actually think there it's more about build quality than anything else. There are some really poor quality cables out there that probably actually work fine, but what I've found is that it doesn't take much for the cable to fail enough that it can start to cause hum or, or introduce noise, or they just fail enough they don't work. I mean, that is another thing that happens. Now, as a reviewer, plugging and unplugging cables, I need them to be good enough that I can do that and they don't break, but that, that standard is pretty low. Um, I've bought a lot of the Amazon special stuff over the years and I've gone through a lot of it, meaning it's broken. So I actually think a lot of those things are, are cheap junk. I don't, I'm not saying it affects the sound. I don't know that it does, but the reliability is very poor and the connector quality is very poor. So, you know, I would stay to some sort of a halfway decent brand. I really like Blue Jeans cables. Um, Jean turned me on to them. I mean, they make the stuff here in the US, the cable stock is really good quality and the connectors are really good quality. I actually think that's like as good as it gets. If you don't like the looks, there's probably other better options, but I, I think their stuff is really good. Um, there are some cheaper companies now that make cables as well and you could always go that route. Um, so that's, I mean, to be honest, that's kind of where I'm at for cables. Uh, for HDMI, I've heard people say that they upgraded their HDMI cables and it made a big difference in video. My experience has been more one of reliability than it has been of video quality. So I don't actually recall ever in changing out an HDMI cable and like the colors looked better. What's happened for me is that I was having reliability problems where sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't, or sometimes it would sync correctly and sometimes it would sync at a, like a lower quality than it was supposed to. Or it would get kind of like, I'd get like lines in the, like in the picture. Um, and so what I have found is that I need to make sure I have a sufficient quality HDMI, but that's a bandwidth issue. It's not like buying a monster cable brand or Cardis brand HDMI is going to fix it and the like mono price won't. It's more about making sure you've got the right versions so that it meets the right standards to handle what you're pushing through it. And if you're running longer cables, you need either an active cable or really preferably fiber optic. So in my home theater, the theater itself is, for the sake of argument, about 20 feet long. So going 20 feet by HDMI is doable with an active cable, but when you include the amount of cable that's needed to go you know, up through the ceiling and kind of has to snake around and then it's got to go down the wall and come out and go up into the receiver and plug into the receiver and you know it's got to come out to the projector and run down and snake around, you know, you're probably looking at more like 30, 35 feet. I think it is 35 feet is what I did. So a 35 foot um, HDMI cable, I really think fiber optic is the better option and you can get those pretty cheap. I think mine was, it's from Monoprice and I think it was like $150. Um, so, you know, for HDMI, it's not brand, it's just sufficient. Um, Blue Jeans Cables does sell HDMI cables and they're very good. I just don't know, I haven't used them enough to know if I would use theirs on longer runs. My experience has been that you have to have active or fiber optic for those really long runs. And I consider anything over 
20 feet to be a pretty long run. Um, if Now let's see, we've done the HDMI cables. Oh, digital cables are gonna be the same as anything else. So um, Toslink, uh, those are the little, little plastic fiber optic cables. I haven't really found make any difference what you buy. They all seem to work about the same. They work or they don't. So I, I've used some really cheap ones and they've been fine. What happens instead is the connectors. So I've found that some of the poor quality ones, the connectors begin to fail and then the cable comes loose. So I like to get a little bit better quality one just so the connector is good, but we're not talking anything expensive here. In fact, I think I have some monoprice ones and I think they're pretty good. So I guess I'm endorsing monoprice here, guys. Um, for uh, the RCA style or XLR style, it's just for RCA, you wanna make sure it's a coaxial style because that's what's a 75 ohm standard. Um, and then the same thing, I just, I really like blue jeans, so I tend to buy their stuff. If you can't afford that, you know, Monoprice makes pretty good stuff for the money. I do recommend them. They're, they can be a little hit or miss on some things, but I think they're a good value. Um, and then the AES EBU type, which is an XLR style, that one, it's best if those are twisted and then in a braid, uh, in, a, in a full braided shield. But otherwise, I don't really find a lot of issues with that. Same thing. I really like Blue Jeans Cable. I think that they make a decent one. They're good for the money. If that's too expensive, I think that you can get some pretty good stuff from Monoprice that will get the job done. Um, just remember that if, if you do have that kind of a digital connection, while it probably will work okay, um, the, the kind like microphone cable isn't really what was designed for that purpose. Um, so there are some AES EBU specific cables you can get. Uh, Hosa probably makes some and actually while well, they've gotten more expensive over the years the quality of their stuff is I actually think pretty decent and, and worth the money. Um, so hopefully the answer to your question in terms of how to pick cables is just don't overdo it. It really doesn't make a big difference. I think the worst thing people can do is get too obsessed with buying even the modest like audiophile type cables and not putting that money somewhere else such as speakers or acoustics. What gets me, to be honest, I don't understand why people are willing to spend thousands of dollars on cables, but they're not willing to spend the same thousands of dollars on an acoustic treatment because the acoustic treatment will make a much more substantial difference in sound quality than the cables will. And in fact, given that people have been challenging Gene and I to these blind tests of cables to prove that they sound different, what I, I guess would counter that point then would be how about we do a blind test comparing the sound difference between an acoustically treated room versus not and compare that to this blind test of cables. There are in fact ways of doing this. I don't know that you could do it in a room very easily, but what you could do is you could actually measure a room using a binaural recording device that's in the ears of the listener. So for instance, if I'm the one who's gonna do the test, I can sit in a room, set the, the speakers up, I have a baseline, no treatment, cheap cables. I put the binaural mics in my ears. I uh, do a calibration of my HRTF, which is actually done by putting headphones over, the headphones I'm gonna listen on, I have to be over ear headphones, over my ears, and I do a sign sweep of that. The microphones pick it up, it measures the, it's called a blocked metis measurement, so it, it measures the, the uh, metis is basically the canal, the ear canal. So uh, it measures the response of my ears on the outside part at least. And uh, I can create a compensation for that, which I'm gonna use for playback. I record, um, it can be done two ways. One would be an impulse response of the system. But in this case, because I wanna know exactly what the speakers were like, what I'm actually gonna probably do is measure music playing back through the speakers and just record it. So that's gonna be baseline. Then I'm gonna do it with upgraded cables. Then I'm gonna do it with low end cables, but acoustic treatment. Then I'm gonna do it with, let's say acoustic treatment and upgraded cables. Now I've got four scenarios to compare against. I'm gonna take those recordings, which I've now put a compensation onto for my HRTF, which is accurate, and then using software that has head tracking, which means it's gonna make it much more realistic I'm going to listen, and, and the best way to do this is actually to listen over headphones in the room with the speakers because you have the visual cues and it keeps it from, it makes sure that you get good externalization, meaning it doesn't collapse in your head and it sounds like it's coming from the speakers. You're, the, the visuals are a big part of how we hear things. So 
I'm going to sit there and I'm going to AB through these in a blind way using an ABX comparator. That would allow me to, to a fairly high degree, compare under blind conditions the different scenarios. I would wager money that the uh, I could do this with 10 listeners and that almost all, if not all of them, are going to hear the acoustically treated room as substantially different, and I would hope better, than the untreated room. I will be shocked if any of them could reliably hear the cables. And so I think if you were to make those comparisons, you would find that from a value standpoint, the money was much better spent on acoustic treatments than, than being spent on cables. I think why people are so okay with spending the money on cables and not acoustic treatments is a convenience issue. It is much more difficult and much more intrusive to put acoustic panels on a wall and to treat a ro uh, the room correctly than it is to buy upgraded cables. In fact, the cables are easy. If you buy upgraded cables, the sound is supposed to improve. Just hook them in. There's nothing to it. Acoustic treatments is a science, and getting it right is harder. It's not even just about putting some panels on the wall. It's putting the right panels on the right wall. Some have to be diffusers. Some have to be bass traps. Some have to be 2-inch absorbers. Some have to be 4-inch absorbers. Maybe some have to be 6-inch absorbers. They, you know, Where does the 6-inch absorber go versus the 2-inch absorber? Where does the diffuser go versus the bass trap? These are things that the average person can't easily navigate. And because of that, it's just easier to throw your hands up, say, I don't want to do this. It's too much. I don't want acoustic treatments in my room. I'm just going to buy the better cables. It'll give me the same improvement. But I really don't think that's true. And I think it's better for us to spend some time trying to train people on how to treat their rooms or provide services like I do than it is to be wasting money on cables. That's my opinion. I understand that not everybody else agrees with that. So I, I hope this is helpful. Um, you know, as I said, I'm not against buying nice looking cables. Cables can be jewelry. And I think when you've got a really expensive high end system, having ugly in wall cables hanging off the back, I even I don't like that. So having a nicely dressed cable, I think is a good idea. I don't think that has to be expensive. Um, as for sound quality, it is my experience having actually tested high-end expensive cables, and by tested I mean listen, not just measure, that they don't make a difference. I have never heard a difference between cables that I could reliably detect. I have in fact done ABX comparisons using uh, headphone methods, and I failed it. I have attempted to do ABX comparisons as I described earlier, they weren't really ABX comparisons, but attempted to do blind comparisons of cables and it failed it. So I don't, I don't really think cables make a difference in sound quality. I think that it's worth getting good quality ones more for the standpoint of reliability and aesthetics. And, and there's a limit to how good they need to be for that to be true. And then I think that money ultimately is better spent on better speakers, that's number one, and acoustic treatment, that's number two. Cables should be like at the absolute bottom of the list. They should be a utilitarian thing, other than, as I said, aesthetics. So if you completely disagree with me, feel free to add it in the comments. I will not get into a huge debate with you over it. Obviously, we may be coming from different worldviews, and I think that's fine. I will say, and I hope this is understood, I don't spite you for buying expensive cables or believing that they make a difference. I don't think you're crazy. I don't have an issue with that. It's just my opinion that they don't make a difference. And I don't think that that's money well spent for me. And if you're gonna ask my advice or what you should do, I don't think you should either. If you wanna do it anyway, that's, as I said, that is fine and I'm not gonna stop you from doing it. I think that these are systems that are meant for entertainment. They should entertain us and we shouldn't be getting worked up over them. I hope this was useful. I hope you found this entertaining and helpful. And um, please subscribe so that you can get more of these videos. Thanks again.